the advice to people considering moving to the country is that if you are professionally motivated to want to do something at a at any level, the opportunities are there. The lifestyle is fantastic. There's clearly less traffic jams. Uh, usually you're near a beach or a park or a, a nice walk somewhere like that, but don't not move purely because you don't think you'll be professionally satisfied or the opportunity to generate a comfortable lifestyle or living is not there in the country because it absolutely is. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the last year, we've talked to many hospitality professionals seeking a tree change, a chance to ply their trade in less frantic surrounds and get a greater connection to the produce and wine that form the basis of a dining experience in a region. Regional restaurants might be booming, but the push in regional areas for better food started long ago. And there are some quiet achievers that have been integral in the sense of place and real culinary identity emerging in different parts of Australia. Matthew Dempsey is the owner of Conlon's Wine Store, the Belfast Port Ferry, and co-owner of Tulip in Geelong. Matthew, how are you going? Morning, Huck. How are you? I'm going well, thanks. Mate, it's um, good to hear your voice. I haven't seen you in about a decade. Um, you've been busy in regional Victoria, setting up amazing restaurants. Um, you've been in Port Ferry six years. What what led you to go to Port Ferry? I guess um, we... Oh, my wife and I um, come back most years because my mum and all my family are from here. So uh, every year um, with the kids, we come down in January and experience the beautiful sunny summer days. And um, I'd often say to her, we should move here. We should move here. And that went on for quite a while. And um, eventually one day she said yes. So we uh, we put the house on the market in Geelong and it sold a little quicker than we anticipated, um, which I guess forced us to really you know, get serious and, and take the plunge. So we, we moved down with the kids um, and it was just a good year for us in um, our oldest was going from primary school into secondary school and our youngest was about to start primary school. So, and the middle guy, he was just in, obviously in the middle. So it's just, just, just good timing for us six years ago. Were you involved with some pretty amazing restaurants in Geelong? Was it hard to leave and make that move? It was. Um, the lifestyle was very appealing to us to come down here. So that was that made it easier. Um, but I guess um, the, the first probably nine months was quite a challenge for me uh, in that Gladiola was still running at a pretty high level in Inverlee. So to give a geographical context to that, that's two hours on the dot at, this, at that point uh, from where we were mm. living. So I was driving two hours to work and then two hours from work. And, wow. Wow. Um, that was a pretty big commitment, uh, five days a week. Um, and then I slowly was able to phase out of that by replacing uh, myself with other staff on particular days of the week or mornings of the week. Um, so that first yeah, nine months was a real challenge. Tell us about Port Ferry. Uh, is there some good produce in that area? It's, 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 it's a well-known place, but many Australians haven't been there. That's right. It, it's a beautiful little town. Um, in fact, one of the, you know, voted only six or eight years ago as one of the best little small communities in the world to live in. Wow. Um, it's a really pretty picturesque town. Um, the locals here are quite protective of the, the history of it. So there's some um, heritage listed or lots of heritage listed buildings. Um, there's some beautiful beaches, stunning golf course, lots of nice little restaurants. And I guess probably the last well, through my last six years, we're starting to see some some interesting little boutique producers pop up, which is um, it, it seems quite natural given that um, it, we get a lot of rain down here, um, mm-hmm. so good growing conditions for beef and lamb and and wheat a bit north of here, and small vegetable producers and honey and and lots of little things like that. So perhaps a bit behind, but it's really starting to uh, move forward now, which is great. You've been in the industry for around 25 years. How different is it running a regional restaurant compared to in the city? It's, um, it's, yeah, I was just reflecting on that the other day. It's 25 years. It's a pretty long time. I don't feel that old, but, um, yeah, when you put it like that, it sounds like a while. Uh, I guess I've never run a restaurant in the city, so it's always been, um, I guess, other than Geelong, it's been always regional for me, even Inverlee. Um, was it's 20 minutes out of Geelong, um, which doesn't sound far, but it's a town of less than a thousand people, so that's still quite regional or small in a sense. Mm. Um, 
we, I guess, when I talk to friends in the city who have restaurants, we face all the same challenges that they face, um, staffing issues, which is, seems to be uh, industry-wide at the moment, um, uh, accessibility to quality product on a daily basis or, or as you need it's a challenge for us. Um, but that just forces innovation and 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 good planning, I think we need to be able to, for example, you know, order our ducks a week in advance or a week and a half or two weeks in advance and commit to an order to make it um, viable for the producer and for us as well. So we, we face a lot of the same challenges, um, but we also have some great lifestyle benefits, which, as you touched on in the intro, I think a lot of people in the industry are starting to see, whether that's in WA or, or mm. New South or Queensland or, or Victoria. Can you tell us a bit about the two venues that you have in Port Ferry? They're in um, amazing buildings because the, the town does have a rich history. Um, t- tell us a little bit about them. They're, they're quite different, the offerings. They are. Conlon started just over four years ago now, and that um, was, I guess, after that first period that I touched on driving back and forth in Valley every day, I realised within you know six to 12 months that that wasn't going to be um, viable for us long term. And I guess once we started to realise that this is where we're going to live for good, um, the opportunity to create something down here was on my mind. That particular site was being renovated. And I kind of just out of the blue called the owner who was in there one day and said, could I have a look? And he said yes. And um, as soon as I walked in, it was probably about maybe you know a third of the way through its uh, renovation and had some really beautiful exposed sandstone um, brickwork done on the, the rear of the building and also the internal fireplaces. Mm. And I was caught immediately and thought, wow, this could make a really cool wine bar. And the concept of the wine bar, you know, loosely termed, was essentially something that Kate and I could just run on our own, just with virtually no staff, um, to suit our lifestyle as far as the hours that we wanted to work and the amount of work we wanted to put into it. So that was where the idea for that came from. And then we had a lot of issues with council getting permits um, because it was all kind of new to me, planning permits, which then led to liquor licensing. So we were delayed for quite a bit. And our liquor license came through on New Year's Eve, which was, I guess, a blessing and a bit of, a, <laughs> a bit of an issue. But um, so we opened that night and just got just got um, really smashed, I guess, for for the, the following four weeks because we just went into the busiest four week stretch of the year for us down here. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that led us, I guess, because of the popularity of the venue immediately, we became more of a restaurant than a wine bar. So selling retail wine for me was a new uh, thing. I hadn't been involved in that, so understanding how to do that. Um, was one challenge, but then understanding how that flowed onto, I guess, lesser margins if you're selling it in a restaurant. So that was a learning process. Mm. And then the Belfast came about uh, two and a half years ago when um, I heard from a friend who's an agent here that it was going to come up for sale, and we'd been trying to get into that property for probably nearly 10 years on and off in, in various wow. ways, and and uh, we weren't ready for it. We were a bit, I guess, tired. Um and didn't have a business plan. We didn't have any idea what we would do with it. Um, but we thought if we don't make an offer and try and get the finance, then it might be another 10 years. So we did. Uh, the offer got accepted. And then we thought, oh, shit, now what do we do? So it was um, a really <laughs> stressful kind of three or four-month period because it was a pretty quick settlement. And then, um, yeah, moved into what was a, essentially an Asian restaurant that we ran for about 12 months until COVID hit. So, Well, tell us a bit about the history of that building because it's pretty important to Port Ferry. It's been there since 1865 that building that's right yeah um it, it's been a council chambers um through its journey it's been a post office as well but it's central to the town literally right in the center of the town it's a great position and it was um restored to its current standards about 14 years i think or 15 years ago um and the guy or the, the family who renovated did a fantastic job so um it had been run down when we come into it we needed to spend I guess, unexpectedly quite a lot of money to bring it back to where it is, but all the bones were there. So the floor was still in really good condition. A lot of the furniture was in really good condition. Um, Structurally, it's all really well um, built. So it's a beautiful building. Um, The facade's obviously heritage listed like a lot of properties in the town, Um, but it's quite a big venue as well. So we like the appeal of that because we can sort of, when it's quiet or during COVID, for example, we can have an intimate dining room of, uh, say, 15 on a quiet Monday night in the middle of winter or Mm. maybe 50 during summer, which is what we've been operating at. Um, But we can go up to 200 because it's licensed for 200. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty versatile building in that regard. What was it like creating that restaurant and the sort of food to offer with, and, you know, with that obligation of that rich history within the building and the importance of that to the town? Can you tell us a bit about 
what you do with the food and the offering? Well, I guess to go back a step, we, we started with an Asian restaurant, which didn't really meet any of those historical obligations at all. In fact, it was quite a uh, – it was like trying to push a square peg in a round hole kind of scenario. <laughs> but, um, the learning from opening Tulip in Geelong after Gladioli originally was that um, if they are perceived to be too similar, you can really damage one business. So we're really conscious of that. We didn't want to go down the path of having something that directly competed with Conlon's because they're literally 200 metres apart. They're really quite close. Mm. Um, and being such a small town, we didn't want to kill one business or take away from that to open a second. So we went for Asian, um, accessible, but found it a really challenging business model to run and learned a lot through that period, but it really took a lot out of us uh, emotionally as well. It was a really hard, stressful 12 months. Um, and when COVID hit, ironically for us in that particular business, it was almost like a bit of a circuit breaker and um, – it was kind of like, let's get out of this and, and go to what we were going to do, which was, you know, I guess, a sort of steak, seafood orientated kind of menu. So mm. we reopened as that um, after the first shutdown last year, middle of June, and immediately it was well received. Um, I was really price sensitive to begin with, but we've had no issues whatsoever. So it's about um, trying to deliver good service. Um, we have about four or five steaks on the menu, quite a good representation of seafood. Yeah, we've been um, pretty fortunate to be able to get the concept right now and it's just a matter of executing daily and trying to um, achieve uh, what we wanted to do. You mentioned that Port Ferry is one of the most beautiful towns to live in. How important are tourists to the offerings that you have and the success of them? Well, they're obviously really important. Um, Like a lot of seasonal um, small towns scattered around the coastline of Australia, we fluctuate heavily depending on uh, the weather usually uh, and holiday periods. Um, mm. we, I guess the, the silver lining for us through the COVID was that when Victorians couldn't travel interstate, um, they come and visited us, which was fantastic. So a lot of people who would normally have gone overseas to Europe or to America or to Northern Australia um, spent time with us um, last year, which is great. For us personally, we focus heavily on trying to um, offer – Um, interesting events and menus um, and connect with our local community because we see that that's where our sustained um, long-term success or viability comes from. If we can keep our locals happy and continually returning, then the tourism trade is a bonus on top of that. And conversely, we're not um, as affected if we have a quieter tourist season because we're still getting good local visitation. Um, Mm. Obviously, there's levels of fluctuation in that but we strongly um, try and price and and have product that appeals to the local area and that's not just Port Ferry because it's a small town there's only two two and a half thousand people here but Warrnambool's 20 minutes away and that's about 40,000 people some of the surrounding areas as well have um, you know people come and visit from Hamilton or, or Ballarat or Geelong so yeah. You've uh, won hats, you've won Young Chef of the Year, many accolades. Where, where did it all start for you? Why did you enter the industry? Uh, it, it came about, I guess, um, when I was 15, um, some family of mine owned a restaurant in Port Douglas in North Queensland. So I went up there on school holidays and spent a couple of weeks with an uncle. And um, during that two-week period that I spent with him, I worked in his restaurant uh, maybe six or eight times just making garlic breads, ironically. Um, but I was immediately hooked on the, the buzz of service. It was almost the, the you know, young chefs all, all talk about the adrenaline rush of a busy service, and that hooked me immediately. I was thinking, wow, this is really cool. It was a vibrant, happening town, and Port Douglas back in 95 and 96 and 97 through to probably 2000 was, you know, a great luxury resort town with um, famous people from all over the world, and um, that lifestyle really appealed to me. So um, I went back and said to mum, I'd like to become a chef, and she said, well, if you can get a job, you can leave school, but if you don't get a job, you can't leave school. So um, it was either that or um, a bit of a a left-field one, but um, some sort of um, gardening or um, landscaping I was really um, interested in also. Um, But, yeah, so I got a job in Port Douglas and moved up there after year 11 and did my apprenticeship uh, up there for four years. So that's how I got into the industry. Wow. Um what what's some have been some of the key moments that have helped shaped uh, the direction that you've gone in? Uh, I, I think when you reflect on your career, um, lots of things influence your journey and your path. That that's people that you encounter, 
probably some of the early ones was I had a, a great head chef when I was in my second year, and he said, if you're serious about cooking, you've got to go to Melbourne. So um, I was able to um, tee up a couple of stages and job interviews at some of the better restaurants there, and that really helped, I guess, set me on the path to wanting to cook nice food and have an understanding and respect for, I guess, uh, you know, sort of higher-end stuff. And that doesn't mean that I have no respect for other things, but it certainly opened my eyes to um, the possibilities of the industry. So I got a job interview, which was a three-day job interview back in those days um, at SSS, which was a legendary restaurant mm. at the time by Donovan Cook and Philippa Sibley. And um, I, <laughs> I probably had more um, career-shaping experiences in that three-day than I have in the last 24 years. <laughs> there was times where, well, most of the time I just wished that um, – the ground would open up and swallow me. I was so out of my depth. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. It was uh, a real eye-opener. But uh, out of that came the desire to want to get to that level. And that, I guess, drove the passion that I had to want to uh, really push hard within the industry. So there were some funny, funny experiences when I think about it now. <laughs> mm. You uh, are still co-owner with Tulip and uh, you mentioned Gladioli and um, letting go of that to move to the country because traveling was just too much. Those restaurants are award-winning restaurants. What was it like running those and having the pressures of things like hats and and setting those sort of standards? Well, I guess for anybody in that position, you probably identify immediately, but it's it's a daily daily challenge there's always a underlying sense of pressure and expectation from your customers, um, which usually is self-driven um we know we're all our own harshest judges and, and biggest critics but um it, it can be a, a huge high if you if you're seeking accolades um we all say no we're not but you know ego is a massive part of being a chef especially one who pushes and you know secretly you always hope you'll get a hat or two hats or whatever it is so mm. um and anybody who says that they aren't motivated by that is probably you know not really telling the full truth but um <laughs> I think as you get older, that certainly it's still nice to be considered in that way, but it's not a motivator these days. It's it's about you know running viable businesses and having happy staff and happy customers. But during that period, it was um, a lot of hours, um, always wanting to create something. Um, it can be a really challenging environment in that respect, but as I said, really rewarding as well if you open the paper and get a great review. Or, um, but you learn a lot through that process also. It was probably, um, I guess, coming out of Pedaval, which was a hatted restaurant for the eight years that I was there, and then into having um, Gladiola, which was two hatted for, for multiple years as well. It was mm. a, a pretty long period of time, and it's nice to now, I shouldn't say not seek that, but certainly it's not a driving force for us. We have no interest in it at all. It's about just cooking nice food and, and um, pre- presenting comfortable, um, happy experiences for people. Is there any dishes that you remember, uh, look back on fondly from the gladioli days that you think sort of typified that period of time in your cooking career? Um, there probably would be. I don't have anything uh, that springs to mind as such. We, we moved the menu relatively quickly. It was all sort of seasonal. So um, we'd see repeat season on season, year after year, similar styles or or um, or methods. Um I guess probably one of the things that I reflect on with fondness is during that period is just the connections with the suppliers. It was really about um, meeting people who had interesting products. So um, uh, there was a great company out the road called Bow and Lamb who we were heavily involved with in, in development for their products. Um, Anthony at Greenvale Farm who had the fantastic free range um, heritage bred pork, um, mm. and Jody um, down at. Um, Great Ocean Ducks popped up around that time. So a lot of those memories and, and relationships are, are great um, memories for me. Uh, and I guess the dishes that come from those were what we were about at that particular time. You mentioned that you're cooking a bit differently these days and you actually have head chefs and sort of run the establishment. So how, how influential are you on the food offering at the moment with the two venues? I guess probably um, as... I have as little influence now as I've ever had, to be honest. Um, I actually work out the front most of the time and have done for, for quite a while. So I have a real passion for wine and wine producers and um, they're actually really similar to uh, premium producers of beef or pork or, or 
whatever else it is as well. They really care about their their farming and their production methods. But as far as the food goes for us now, we've got one head chef and he oversees both both restaurants. Um, and the guys kind of work between the two venues as well. And mm-hmm. despite us having two venues, we're actually really low staff. So once COVID hit, we probably lost, I'd say, 15 to 20 staff. And we're now running with about probably eight between the two, which is um, as low as it's ever been. Uh, but those guys, um, they'll come for guidance or advice on a, a technique or a product or um, a price point or or a style, how it might fit into the menu and the feel. But other than that, I don't have much say unless I see something that doesn't look right on the day. <laughs> you also mentioned um, how important local producers were to the success of Gladioli. What, what are the local producers like around you and and working with those uh, for your menu? Uh, they're, they're popping up as a touch on at the start. So we're starting to see um, close to us as an extinct volcano uh, and around the surrounds of that there's some great little um, farms doing potatoes and garlic and berries and stone fruit and all sorts of things. So um, the, the guys in the kitchen will stop off their daily or every couple of days and, and pick up bits and pieces from there. Uh, there's a really great biodynamic organic farmer just on the western side of Warrnambool, who we buy um, buy quite a bit of product through. But I guess for the younger guys in the kitchen, it's that um, conversation of how do you get uh, enough product or consistency of delivery versus wanting to buy the best product that you can. So we'll talk to them about um, let's just buy his product and then work out what we're going to do with it as opposed to going, well, we're going to put this dish on and we have to have it there all the time. So there's a bit of an educational process through that. Um, and then we still have contacts with um, Jody, uh, as I said. So we buy a bit of duck from her still, and um, other little small producers around. There's free range eggs and honey and things like that. So hopefully we'll, we'll continue to see more. Mm. Um, yeah. You mentioned you're in the kitchen less these days, and you're on the floor, and you have a real um, passion for wine. Um, tell us a bit about your wine program there, and and what, what do you love about Australian wines? Uh, I think, uh, well, we don't have a, um, I guess we're not, we don't have a sommelier. We, we did for quite a while, but I developed, a, um, I guess, a real love of wine when, when I first started the restaurants. Um, uh, so Belfast has about probably 250 wines on the list and Conlon's is probably about 200-ish, I'd say, and that varies just season to season as in who's around it and how much stock we're going through. Um, we focus, I guess, on um, mostly family um, own vineyards um, within Victoria and around the country. We do have quite a bit of international product as well. Um, as far as Australian goes, I think uh, some of the, um, I think Australia will already competes obviously on a world stage, but some of the um, more recent plantings will, will become absolute benchmarks within the world. I think some of the product that, uh, as an example, the, the Far family at Bannockburn there use um, the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, the plantings, the, the clone um the the clone choice the orientation of the rows the width of the rows Mm -hmm. the height um that's world-class farming as far as i can see um and i think the um, product that's starting to come off that particularly when they've got 30 or 40 years of family experience at that site so they know vintage on vintage the variational changes or the seasonal changes um yeah i'm really excited by some of the product that we see coming from those kinds of um producers not only them, uh, and there's a lot of them around the country. So I think Australia has um, – and the other thing probably we have is such a diverse climate um, and geography that you can get great examples of pretty much any varietal if you know where to go for it. The last year has been pretty challenging for many operators. Uh, you mentioned briefly that being a regional uh, operator was an advantage in the sense that people couldn't travel overseas and were hitting the regions and checking them out. Um what sort of impact did the last year have on, on what you do in Port Ferry? Uh, I guess um, uh, from a simple business point of view, uh, we had a, a real boom in that June-July period once um, the restrictions down here opened after that 12-week period and then we got shut again for that five- or six-week period, which was pretty dead, obviously, and then we had a really good period from then and through until now. Um, so from an economical point of view, it hasn't been disastrous at all for us other than the fact we were shut for those, I think, you know, 15 or 16 weeks in total. Mm. Um, as far as the way that we trade and operate now, it was a really good chance to reset um, and, and start to look at 
some of the things that we have always done and why we do those. Um, and as an example, um, we have always served coffee, but about, say, I think five years ago in all the restaurants, we went to filter coffee only, so really delicious single-origin coffee, um, but we don't do cappuccinos or or short blacks or anything like that or, or haven't done for that period of time. And so when COVID hit, I actually looked at the figures in relation to our coffee sales at the Belfast because the uh, coffee machine broke. So I was like, well, I don't want to buy a new one or spend more money um, fitting it if I don't need to. So, And it was making up less than 1% of our um, annual revenue. It was so low, but obviously the skill that goes along with making a consistently good coffee, the product that goes with it, you know, multiple sorts of milk, um, coffee, and then the variations on doing those was a a highly skilled position. So we took a pretty bold move and just stopped serving coffee full stop. Wow. So have coffee or tea available anymore. And it actually, if you manage it well, it doesn't present a problem. We get probably one in 50 requests who sort of cracks the shits a little bit, but it's just <laughs> such a small part of our business. And with, you know, 250 or 270 beverage offerings, if they can't find something that's probably – it's certainly the way that we operate anyway. It's not a big drama and it won't stop people coming to us because of that. Mm. So that was one thing. Um, our booking times, we got really, um, got really, I guess, quite articulate on how we do those. Uh, we're able to tighten up our service times, um, offering good service still, but in a far more condensed period. So um, rather than having eight people in after 8 or 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, where we're probably throwing away any profit that we made in the first sitting, we actually now just won't take that um, if there's no demand to do a bigger sitting. So mm-hmm. a lot of those kinds of things. And um, we're trading less. The staff are getting a better life or work-life balance. Um, and the bottom line from a profitability point of view is probably better because of that. The revenue wow. may not be at the same level, but we're making more money out of it. So there's a lot of learning in regards to those little things, booking deposits. Um, yeah, so there's been – a lot of things we've reflected on. I thought, why do we do it? Do we have to do it? Um, how will people see our business if we don't do it or, or change the way we do it or introduce it for that matter? How important has uh, moving to the country, I know you said it was six years ago, how important has that been to you and that sort of work-life balance? Has that experience changed you and the way you approach your career? A hundred percent. For me, it has personally. Um, so when we're at our peak as far as, busyness down here we had the three venues and probably 25 or 30 staff between them and there was periods where i was able to have random saturdays off or thursday night off so the last three or four or five years i've been able to get involved with local community through the cricket club so i'm the president of the cricket club which i I really love um i've been able to be involved in like um coaching football and helping coach football at a couple of local teams um and played cricket a little bit over the last few years things that as a chef or a career hospitality person, you just forego or, or just think mm. that you never get the chance to do. So, and yes, you can do that in the city as well, but it kind of, um, for me, was the circuit breaker, I guess, to really just say, well, why do we do this? Do we need to chase hats all the time? Or can we just try and have a, a, a business that suits our lifestyle that provides enough income to live off? You know, we're never going to be millionaires. We don't drive Maseratis. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a little Volkswagen Golf still, um, and I love it. But, um, I think when you get to, for, for us anyway, we sort of say, well, why are we doing this? And always compromising Easter's and, and birthdays and Christmas when, you know, perhaps we don't have to do that anymore. So, Well, you've made a real success of that move to the country and um, the regional dining has just really boomed in the last decade and you've been a part of that. What, what sort of advice would you give to hospitality professionals looking for that sort of tree change, whether it's to buy a restaurant or even just work in the I think um, probably the best advice I can give is that one of the things that really struck me, um, I guess right up until I was involved in the Appetite for Excellence program, so that was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and there was always, through my first 10 years in the industry, there was always a a city versus country kind of mentality, not in a competitive sense, but they were seen as different for some reason. So Mm. we'd go to the Good Food Guide every year and there was always a best new country restaurant and then there was always a best new city restaurant and there was always a best country wine list and a best um, city wine list. And I I couldn't quite work that out Mm. because I'd never worked in the city. It just didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand why they were different. So I began to think to myself, are we is one hat in country not as good as one hat in city or is this wine list uh, in the country not as good? And I guess through the Appetite for Excellence program, getting exposure to um, meeting a lot of chefs and restaurateurs and waiters from those city restaurants, I began to realise that they're actually just exactly the same. Mm. 
Mm. Um, the, the best regional restaurants are as good, if not better, than the best city restaurants. There's no difference in my mind on that. So the advice to people considering moving to the country is that if you are professionally motivated to want to do something at, a, at any level, the opportunities are there. The lifestyle is fantastic. There's clearly less traffic jams. Uh, usually you're near a beach or a park or a, a nice walk somewhere like that. And again, those things are available in the cities, um, but don't not move purely because you don't think you'll be professionally satisfied or the opportunity to generate a comfortable lifestyle or living is not there in the country because it absolutely is. Mm-hmm. Well, the last year has been um, challenging for many and uh, being in Port Ferry has been a, a benefit because people have been travelling there and it's helped uh, keep the business afloat. What are you expecting for the next year? What's your hope for the for the for 2021? I think um, we, we sort of down here are at least expecting solid visitation um, tourism-wise for the, for the rest of this year. I think with the uncertainty around pe- domestic travel, um, people reluctant to book interstate because the, the premiers are happy to close them overnight. Um, we're seeing uh, or the bookings, I guess, forward bookings uh, accommodation-wise are really solid down here, and I think that'll continue on. Um, from us as a business uh, or operators, we're really conservative still. Um, so we've traded at probably about 70% of what we normally would do, but um, even today, before I started talking to you, just watching a couple of new COVID cases in Victoria, um, if that if, we, if we're listed as an exposure site, for example, we'll be closed for a week or two. So hmm. having enough money in the bank to pay the staff is really important for us. Um, being up to date with our bills is really important. Um, so there's a real level of conservatism around. Um, I don't think, for us anyway, I don't think we're out of the um, out of the weeds, um, uh, pardon the pun, at, the, at this point um, in time, we'll still trade quite conservatively for the next six to 12 months until vaccine kicks in and we see what results that shows. Well, Matt, it's been really great to catch up with you. Um, congratulations on the venues down there. I know they're very popular and um, people should go and check them out. Um, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Huck. Appreciate the time. It's nice to catch up. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospital community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.